Today's topic is the impact of 5G on today's training. My name is Linda Brent, and I support strategic planning for the National Training and Simulation Association. For those new to NTSA, we are a nonprofit association dedicated to facilitating dialogue between government, industry, and academia on topics related to providing the best possible modeling, simulation, and training systems for our warfighters, first responders, and critical infrastructure roles. We host a portfolio of nine events each year, the last of which is the IATIC conference, the largest training and simulation conference and expo of its kind in the world, which will be held live this year in Orlando beginning on 30 November. Due to COVID-19 restrictions this past year, NTSA, like many others, has been forced to move many of our events to virtual worlds. But virtual worlds are a sweet spot to us in the training community. As a means of increasing this critical dialogue while sheltered, we brought together a team to develop and produce webinars on topics of interest to the training and simulation community. We're pleased that so many of you have chosen to join us today. I first want to thank our sponsor for today's webinar, Terrasoft Technology Corporation, the trusted government IT solutions provider, works with proven vendors with 5G solutions to accelerate to accelerate the delivery of real-time information from any device, any time, and anywhere. I would now like to introduce Dr. David Metcalf, the moderator for today's event. Dr. Metcalf is the director of the Mixed Emerging Technology Integration Lab, or METAL, at the University of Central Florida Institute for Simulation and Training. David, thanks for participating today. We are honored to have you with us. Over to you. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here with our NTSA audience too, and thank you for that nice introduction, Linda. I'm excited to share with you today some of a, a host of people that are doing interesting and innovative use cases in 5G for training and simulation. And instead of a whole PowerPoint show, what we're going to do is give you an innovative virtual tour of one of the latest hotspots in the innovation showcase world of Central Florida, the Verizon 5G innovation hub that's brought to you by uh, both Lake Nona and uh, the uh, Tavistock group too. And to tell us a little bit more about uh, Tavistock and how this came into being, we've got Juan Santos, who is their head of innovation and strategy. Hi Juan, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Juan Santos and I lead uh, brand experience and innovation for Lake Nona. Uh, Lake Nona is a living lab where technology and people come together to really think about the next stage in what cities and living environments look like. And this is a critical example of, of that in action. This is actually a shared space between Verizon and LEED, which is a startup accelerator, in which we're looking at how 5G can have an impact on health, on well-being, on sports, and on the way that we generally lead our lives. Uh, so this is the Verizon 5G innovation hub. Tell you a little bit more about what we're doing here, I want to introduce Charlie from Verizon who can give us a little bit of a rundown of what the idea is for this innovation hub at Lake Nome. Hey, good morning. Charlie Caggiano, the Government Solutions Product Manager here uh, at Verizon Business Group. I'm a 23-year uh, uh, military member uh, transitioning right now, uh, five years uh, flying in, or correction, five years fixing airplanes, 18 years flying them as MT-130H uh, navigator with almost 3,000 flight hours and over 1,000 simulator hours. I really appreciate what the NTSA is doing here, both in the DOD as well as the uh, commercial aviation uh, community. Um, the simulation uh, in aviation is very important. We always, we had a saying in AFSOC, we used to, uh, we, we, uh, we, um, sweat in training so we don't bleed in combat. And um, the Air Education and Training Command has really uh, um, put their, uh, a lot of emphasis on immersive training with their Pilot Next program. It has been very successful in developing uh, immersive training in aviation. And my last assignment was at the school, the largest uh, flying training schoolhouse uh, in the Air Force. And we were able to capture both the, the students who were uh, flying and um, a co come from a traditional flying training as well as the uh, the pilot next program and their capa capabilities as a whole were, were pretty much on par. And so the DOD has really realized how the immersive training 
um, has become very important, and they're um, they're they're actually uh, looking to invest more in, in immersive training. And here at Lake Nona and at Verizon, uh, we also understand that the uh, the students that we uh, that will be looking to support will have three to five better. Uh, chance of absorbing the material in an immersive environment and it's two to three times cheaper. And we really focus at like Nona the um, the uh, providing the platform which the uh, immersive training can help benefit uh, both the DoD and, and the commercial industry uh, with our 5G and our mech network. Um, I appreciate your time. I really hope you enjoy this webinar and uh, I'm open to any questions if uh, if you need them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Charlie, for both sponsoring this space and what Verizon has done. And we're eager to show off what's been built and what's in place here, as well as what's going on in the Team Orlando community that uh, supports and serves the whole of the training and simulation and modeling space too. So next, we also have Juan sharing with us some of the technology from MetaViz. Yeah, so this is a prime example of some of the things that we're doing in the space to actually look at how immersive technologies can help in the way that we work in healthcare. This is the MetaVis visualization rig, and what it allows you to do is it allows doctors and practitioners to see medical imaging in place on top of the patient's body as they're, as they're doing any kind of procedure. Traditionally, you have doctors and other practitioners looking at separate screens or, or, or light tables to look at diagnostic imaging, the MetaVis technology uses augmented reality to provide an overlay over the patient that actually allows the practitioner to keep focus both on the patient and on the diagnostic imaging in the same frame of view so that they're able to be more accurate and to be able to perform surgeries faster. We will hear though that it actually has significant uses in training as well because it also allows for positional video when you're in training environments where you have multiple uh, people that are getting training or, or, or medical students looking at a, at, a, at a situation and it allows for an incredible immersive training uh, environment. Thanks so much Juan. It's been a, it's a great overview of some of the things that are in place here permanently. We also have a number of things that rotate through and what we're going to do is kind of give you a speed tour of some of the things that we have rotating through right now too. We're incredibly thankful to the sponsors for TSA with Dell and Kerasoft and at UCF, you can actually see how much um, we use uh, Dell's platforms too for all of our safety and security around the uh, whole smart city concept. If you think about the size of a 72,000 person uh, campus and all of the support personnel, it really is the size of a, of a city block or a series of city blocks that uh, we've got there. And uh, Dell is one of the, the places that we use that too. So thinking about the smart city concept and how that supports government, and how that supports academia, military. Those are some of the things that um, I know we've seen from Dell as a partner in those areas. Come on over this way and we'll take a look at a couple other innovations too. Juan talked a good bit about healthcare and there's a number of different healthcare use cases that are here inside of the area. The first one that you're seeing here is something that's in place at Orlando Health. This is Betty. Betty is a social companion robot that operates on 5G to be able to follow locations, to greet patients as they come in, allow them to start their paperwork automatically, and even to pick up on voice, if you're in a enclosed area, pick up on voice and allow you to um, interact with her um, that way to start your records or to start some of your other areas. So those are some of the things that, um, that we um, are able to, uh, to do and uh, that we've uh, been building uh, in conjunction with Orlando Health that uh, might be of interest to some of you too when we start to combine in robotics. These particular screens here also have all of the learning modules. The learning modules are um, in place so that uh, you can actually go through and get patient education on this as well. Those are some of the things that, uh, that, that you might see there too. So it's been incredible to see what uh, Foundry X and the innovation unit has been doing, and uh, that's something that uh, we're quite proud of in the partnership between Orlando Health and, uh, of course, uh, UCF, too. So those are some of the examples we wanted to make sure and showcase. Let's go over and take a look at a few other items. 
So here we have uh, something that some of you may have seen from us before too. As part of our COVID response, we have these cards. Now, a simple deck of playing cards, a mobile app too, but also some unique features. The ability to go in and as you are um, using these cards, there is an augmented and virtual reality um, uh, set of features for this. So you have augmentation using Zapper app and the ability to highlight over any one of the cards. And when you highlight over the card, it uh, brings up a interactive module, like in this case, a COVID cough dispersion simulator that uh, was built for Army uh, Future Command and uh, the STTC here in Orlando as part of this whole campaign and part of the Army's service out to the environment and uh, local community too, going out not only to military, but also to other civilian hospitals and uh, making that just part of the overall COVID response. So those are some of the things that we've been able to participate in. Um, we've also had a number of other um, augmented and virtual reality examples too from the medical and health space. This is a Navy Corman exercise that allows you to have uh, competency-based assessments. And as you go through and have those competencies, using a, uh, in this case, Magic Leap headset, you can uh, go through and test for those, not only to minimum mastery, but to overall full competency too, and, and to that full mastery level. So those are some of the things that you're seeing here. You can also show complex process flows, like how data moves throughout a system, whether that be information retrieval using XAPI and going to the competency management tools, recommenders, learning profile systems, so kind of a way to visualize that some of the complexity of learning architectures too is one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we were able to do. A lot of these technologies are supported by back-end technology and infrastructure like the blockchain and quantum defense simulator that was just put into place by um, ARO, Army Research Office, at UCF as a new capability that allows for um, complex and uh, sophisticated uh, processes and features like um, in the case of COVID, do, using COVID imaging and being able to um, take any of the images that you might get from x-rays, CAT scans, or MRIs and be able to process those and uh, through, through artificial intelligence and then be able to take those same images and those same um, uh, background information that's processed through AI and put that on a blockchain. So that's a way to have an immutable and distributable record that's decentralized that everyone can trust within the whole ecosystem. Those are some of the use cases we're seeing that start to, to touch on the back-end infrastructure of 5G and the way that it's being used inside of the, the medical community. We're also using this for other applications too within tracking and tracing of so let's call it your universal transcript of everything that you've done from recruit to retire in a military setting and being able to have that on a blockchain too so that you have this sophisticated record that can move with you through your whole career and allow you to follow those steps and follow those processes. Those are some of the things that we're finding are useful about the way that we can uh, leverage and use blockchain and also quantum defense for cybersecurity and being able to make sure that we keep all of our assets safe in those environments. Those are some of the things that we're seeing as the more sophisticated use cases that are being explored right now. So with that um, too, the other thing that uh, we'd like to, to show is um, a couple of the other examples of augmented and virtual reality. So those are some of the things that uh, we've been working on. One of the ones that uh, we'll be talking about a little bit more in a few minutes is looking at the way that we've used uh, uh, mobile apps for PPE, personal protective equipment during COVID and the training there too. Hundreds of thousands of people have gone through some of the training for not only the corpsmen and uh, combat medics, but also for some of the other areas that we've been working in too, like personal protective equipment with the VA and uh, their uh, commitment and response to COVID, leveraging the power of 5G augmented and virtual reality cases. We've got a few other examples too that you're seeing on the screen here. This is an example of leveraging not only augmented and virtual reality, but leveraging some of the biometrics and uh, physiometrics. Uh, what you see here is one of our uh, STAR students putting on one of the NeuroSky 
um, EEG, uh, brain gateway sensors. So in this case, uh, he's able to see, and what he's looking at, it shows the brain waves here to show the alpha, beta, and gamma waves. And uh, with uh, Dr. Anya Andrews at our College of Medicine, who came up with this idea to be able to focus on the heart. And when you focus on the heart, it automatically brings up the content about the heart. So it's a, a way to start to combine through Bluetooth and through high-end signal, both augmented and virtual reality along with the signal from other devices. Those are some of the things that we're finding that are going to be more compelling for use cases around 5G. I want to turn it over to introduce our friend, um, Eric Bruns, who he leads up the VA SimLearn Center that's here also in Orlando, and turn it over to him to talk about some of the great innovations that we've been working on, uh, that he's been working on over there, and that we partner with from UCF. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Dave. Hello, as Dave said, my name is Eric Bruns, and I am the Executive Director of the Simulation Learning Evaluation Assessment and Research Network, or SimLearn. We are fortunate enough to have a 53,000 square foot simulated hospital that allows us to provide immersive and high fidelity training of procedures and any training that our clinicians will need throughout the VHA. The beauty of having uh, a location here in Lake Nona is that we are working with Verizon to bring 5G into our building. That is going to allow us to really expand and improve the types of education products we're able to uh, provide to our clinicians throughout VHA. You heard earlier about Metavis. This we are using to provide surgical augmented reality and take that immersive environment and distribute it such that learners can simultaneously, whether, no matter where they are in the, in the country, work on and look at uh, spatially anchored holographic content and take that content and improve their procedures as they work toward improving the care that veterans receive. In addition to Metavis, we have several courses such as the point of care ultrasound, as well as the musculoskeletal uh, training that we can take virtual reality and have learners work simultaneously or work with learners across our uh, clinicians across the nation and improve their skills without having to leave uh, their, their uh, region or location. Previously, our facility was had a schoolhouse model that required learners to travel to us. With the advent of uh, 5G and in, uh, providing that in our facility, we're able to distribute and provide virtual training uh, at a reduced cost but more importantly, as at an improved effectiveness for our uh, veterans and throughout the VHA. Um, we're also able to use that 5G to work in conjunction with other SIM centers throughout VHA to develop together uh, more education products and more um, simulations and simulation scenarios that can be used throughout VHA and, and to improve the care that veterans receive uh, and also provide a location for those education products to be uh, readily accessible as the, per as the personnel need it and to use it in their local and regional facilities. An example, as Dave mentioned before, uh, was the uh, providing the COVID training, the changes that had to happen in procedures, the changing changes in donning, PPE, and so forth, we were able to put that in one location such that anyone that needed it throughout the country can reach it and use it and provide it to improve veterans. So thank you so much, and I'll turn it back over to Dave. Thank you so much. It's great to see what you guys have done with this national showcase and national center here in Orlando, too. And it's great the work that you've been doing. Appreciate it so much, Eric. Thank you. Right. Take care. We're going to keep moving and go and uh, take a look at some of the, the technologies um, that behind the scenes that provide not only the uh, cyber infrastructure that we need, but also just the support that we need to be able to uh, function with 5G and leverage some of the incredible technologies that have been uh, in use. I want to turn it over to Steve Farrow, who's going to tell us a little bit about the great work that CACI is doing in this area. Steve, over to you. 
Great. Thank you, Dr. Metcalf. So I'm assuming everybody can see the charts out there. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you real quickly about how CACI is leveraging 5G and, and putting that actually into play with a couple products that we have here um, that I'll present to you. Let me roll the next chart here and we'll get rolling. So today's problem. So think about today as you're driving down the road and how many people are sitting there looking at their iPhones or looking at their uh, GPS in their cars as opposed to looking out the window at their surroundings and where they should be looking. Uh, now imagine that if you're out in the dirt somewhere and, and you have bad guys in front of you and they're shooting at you while you're looking down at your GPS. Not a good scenario. And that's, that's basically today's problem that 5G and augmented reality is, is going to solve for us. So the scenario here, if you take a, a set of augmented reality glasses and you implement uh, the GPS capability and you pump all that into the glasses, so now you know exactly where you're located. Uh, in addition to that, you can also know where your friendlies are. And if you have the right intelligence coming in, you also know where your enemies are. And so that's, that's this scenario that we have in front of us. Uh, moving forward as well, there's also a commercial application of both 5G and augmented reality. Uh, here's an example real quickly in front of you of, of what's called the, the Vuzix Blade sunglasses. These are about $800 They're off the shelf. And what we've done is we've taken uh, those commercial off the shelf glasses and integrated those directly with your iPhones. Uh, not a hard task. Now you take that one further and now what we're doing here is we've used uh, internal R&D and the off-the-shelf products that, that are out there. And now you can integrate into here a variety of different things. Uh, you, you build the software, so it's looking for certain uh, vehicles that are moving or vehicles that are not moving. And then, for example, if your location is 500 meters in front of you, is it clear and are you protected and safe to go to that point uh, without any obstruction? And then going here to another scenario, this is another product we have. This one's called the Remote Support Kit. Uh, the scenario that we look at in this case is you're out in the field, you're supporting an operation, and a system, doesn't matter what it is, fails. And you've, you've worked to try to resolve it. You cannot get the system up and working. Well, what do you do from here? The first thing you do is you put on your headset, you call back to headquarters, and in this case, you could have both pumped into the, head, the headset a, a person that you can physically, that you will be able to see, communicate with. Uh, in addition to that, you'll have your electronic uh, user manual right there in front of you in an animated scenario where that's, that uh, the, the inoperability of your situation, whether it's your vehicle, your radar, your weapons, or whatever the case may be, you'll be walked through how to fix that right there in real time. And moving to another scenario. So this next one here, uh, this is a case of products that we are already developing for the Army's night vision electronic sensor directorate out to uh, sensor directorate up at Fort Belvoir. Uh, this is a case of what's called the TAK, the TAC, which is the Tactical Assault Kit. Uh, outside of DOD, that could be Team Awareness Kit. Uh, this was actually by Popular Science Magazine uh, recognized as one of the greatest innovations of 2020 uh, for what it did during the Colorado wildfires. Um, essentially, what this is doing is that top right-hand corner is integrated with the three products down at the bottom there, the Maverick, and the Maverick is a long-range long sensor, uh, optical sensor with shortwave uh, and midwave IR. Okay, and then it's got the information from the TAC in the top right hand corner. That information now is integrated into that product right there. Uh, same thing with the Delta I. This is also a uh, domestic and international program. Um, this one here is uh, fully digital uh, goggles, which allow both AR, VR scenes to be seamlessly displayed in there. It's being used with US, UK, Canadian, and Australian uh, countries. And the far bottom right-hand side is what's known as IVAS, and this is Microsoft HoloLens. Um, the picture that you're looking at there is from 2020, September 2020. It's Soldier Touchpoint uh, efforts, and Defense News had this in their, their uh, October edition where soldiers are using the IVAS prototypes right there to control drones, 
uh, in bringing in live drone feed, monitor real-time health metrics, uh, and incorporate friendlies uh, into their location so they'll be able to see where the rest of the friendlies are. Um, and then, like I say, the, the amount of capability tied to this is endless where you can actually bring in enemies as, as the intel, the intelligence is all incorporated. Um, so anyways, those are a few examples of how we at CACI are leveraging 5G and pulling in uh, augmented reality, integrating it all together into uh, actual products now that are being delivered and used out in the field. And that being said, here's some contact information. With that said, David, back to you. Great, Steve. It's so great to be partnered with you guys and to see the incredible work that you're doing, combining in some of those use cases around advanced cyber for defense, some of the ways it's being used with augmented and virtual reality, and just the great work that you guys are doing to support uh, the cause of military and uh, government operations. So next, I'd like to continue with that theme and talk about some of the things going on here at NOC TSD, the incredible new tech bridge and the um, Naval X activities. We have our very own Tim Welch, who is here with us too from NOC TSD to tell you a little bit more about some of the projects and some of the applications that they've been working on too. So Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, David. So I, I want to give a, a little a brief explanation of what um, the Tech Grove, that uh, specifically the, the capability that we have at NOC TSD and then the associated Tech Bridge. Um, so the Tech Grove is our new um, installation that is going to allow us to rapidly move through some of these projects in new and innovative ways that um, we can reach out to industry and have as uh, Diana Teal, our, our chief evangelist, likes to say, the garage guys come to the door. And it's not just garage guys, it's things like 5G, it's things like um, being able to uh, build out LVC networks on the floor with the actual equipment that we're using to um, support those in the fleet. Um, our bridge is associated with uh, Naval X. If you haven't heard of Naval X, it is from the um, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for uh, Research Deve uh, Development and Acquisition, where it's a rapid accelerated um, a acquisition uh, approach enabled by a series of tech bridges throughout the fleet. Um, one of uh, the first ones is the Central Florida Tech Bridge. We, we already have a great um, uh, Team Orlando um, and, and, and ecosystem already established, and we figured we would just use that and, and build on that. So the tech bridge allows us to reach out to other partners throughout the Navy. We're uh, specifically focused on training, but if something comes about that it comes into um, not TSD and the tech bridge and says, hey, we've got this new innovation with uh, materials or manufacturing, we can definitely connect that with the, the appropriate tech bridge that's out there that is doing that work. So we've got a hyper-connected ecosystem of ecosystems developed for the tech bridge concept. What, some of what we've already got established in the Tech Grove itself is we've got the LVC dock, which is our um, uh, operation center for LVC events. We've got, a, we've got that built out a node there that you can um, you know, actually see the work on and that is going there. We've also got um, some cyber defense, um, some uh, cyber defense uh, activities that are associated with the, the LVC dock. We've got a fully connected network that goes back to uh, the Flores not right now. Um, the, some of the things that we're looking to do in, in the future is to connect up with the TIF, which is right next door um, from the Army's uh, simulated training environment and see if we can get some, um, some inner service operations. Specifically, one of the targets is 5G, but looking to establish 5G and see what we could do with um, training in a hyper-connected local um, uh, substantiation. I, I even see one of the questions asking about, um, do we have to have internet connection? This is one of our opportunities to figure out some of those ATO security challenges that go along with that in a training environment. We know that it's very different. It's very, um, we've got lots of industry capabilities. Um, and another example, you're, uh, David showing you right now, the, the, the 68 Whiskey, the medic um, training that that was part of my project with Defense Health Agency, where we're looking at what is it, what do we actually need to modernize and develop an infrastructure enterprise capability for um, delivering training 
both operationally, so that deployed medic, but then also back in the military health system where we've got a treatment facility in Omaha. And how does that medic move back and forth between those, those two jobs? We maintain the readiness for that person that is in Omaha that is about to be deployed. And then how do we transition that deployed um, medical personnel back into our uh, military health system? Um, and then, you know, we are also seeing, uh, the, this was built off of our initial efforts datum, uh, dating and training effectiveness model, where we're looking to build those networks and um, establish that. So we've got a lot of great, exciting things happening with, with the Tech Grove, with the Tech Bridge, and we hope to um, be able to connect out to things like the Lake Nona Institute just here locally to enable some new innovative collaborations. Thanks so much, Tim. It's been great to hear from you today, too, and see some of the things that uh, the Navy is doing and looking at that, the ways that 5G is, uh, is enabling the force, looking at remote and long distance uh, connectivity applications, too, that are advanced. Those are some of the things that uh, you're going to see more of throughout all the services. And we're glad to show you a few of those today, too. So next, well, we'll come hey, over. And before, before you leave that, David, uh, they, we totally forgot the big one, our mobile effort with delayed entry program. If you could give like a two second uh, overview of that, because that's definitively mobile and cellular and, and very much in the vein of what we're talking. <laughs> yeah, another great use case too. So thank you, Tim, appreciate it. We'll continue on with our tour and we're gonna pick back up with looking at some of the things that are going on within the Lake Nona uh, Verizon 5G Innovation Hub and some of the key features and capabilities in the accelerator part of this, where we're bringing in next generation innovators and looking at the ways that we can help grow those capabilities over time. Juan, I'd like for you to tell us a little about some of the, the, the features and capabilities that are in place that uh, we have available for some of the entrepreneurs who come in here and a little bit more about the programs and things that you have. Great, so thank you. So what, what, one of the things that's interesting about this space is that we wanted to commingle established company like Verizon with their high-end 5G innovation technology with uh, early stage startups. So we actually have a program that runs in the space called Lead, uh, uh, Lake Nona, which actually brings companies that are in the early stages and we bring them in uh, to actually work on their products and work on their projects. And it's targeting specifically companies in the sports, technology, and health intersection. And we provide investment, we provide a place to work, actually we provide a place to live. They live in the same building that we're in, which has residential units. It's a micro-apartment model, it's, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a micro-apartment model, and it's, it's, it's really this work, live, play kind of innovation. But we also allow them to interact with the people that are continuously coming um, through the space and through a large network of, net, uh, a large network of mentors. The other thing that we provide that's interesting is that there's a couple of services that you normally are find difficult to find, kind of like in a, in a co-working environment, uh, but we've purposely, purposely added them here. So one of the examples that we have is, instead of the traditional office printer that you would have in a co-working space, we actually have a fairly good you know, you know, 3D printer, which some of the startups have actually used to create parts for some of the technologies that they're working with. This is actually a part of a connected gym that is being developed as part of our, our environment. Uh, and it's one of the services that they both get directly inside the space, both for the companies that are here and for the innovators and startups that visit us every day. Now, Juan, these are some of the same types of innovations that are used in high-end professional athletics, but also are used in our elite forces, too. If we think about the way that sensors everywhere wearable computing, and some of the, the innovations that are also entering into our military and our forces are going are using as well. Yeah, too, we actually right? find that or, or warrior athletes, as we like to think of them, mm -hmm. you know, or military forces, and things that we do with extreme performance or elite performance athletes are very, are, you know, there's a big overlap about the types of environments that they have to deal with. Dealing with stress, the learning processes that actually have to do with that is something that there's a huge correlation between the two. So of the technologies that we have here, which include movement and heart and stress tracking, movement analytics, 
uh, mitochondrial DNA testing that allows you to see how you're actually aging and how the environment is having an effect on you, as well as other technologies that we are incubating here. All of those have applications, not only in the sports and health space, but with our warrior athletes as well, which is how we'd like to think of that, to just create this continuous environment for both civilian and military people that are in the high performance business. Kind of like the automated uh, swim uh, technology that Flex has, one of the, the companies here too, one of the incubator startup yes. companies too. That's something that could also be used in the military applications with our Navy and with other Without a doubt, forces. I mean, we have, they, they have developed, and it's actually a shipping product that actually you attach to your swimming goggles that provides very accurate movement analytics uh, of your swimming and, work, and, and, and workout. But at the same time, it also uses uh, vibration pulses to actually communicate information in a completely quiet way as you're swimming uh, about your pace, about speed, about your body, which is which is a technology that has great applications uh, all over. Uh, and it's high performance because, you know, the team actually has all of them are competitive athletes, including an Olympic swimmer that's actually training for the Olympics right now. That's great. Yeah, so those are examples of some of the technologies that will continue to cycle through here with each of these cohorts that you have too. Mm -hmm. So there's a continuous kind of evergreen cycle of innovation too that you have with these companies exactly. coming in to interact. Exactly. So this is a six-month program. We actually uh, looked at 450 applications for the first cohort, which includes six companies. We're actually in the process of going through the second cohort at this point in time. And the idea is that we will bring the companies in but we're not asking them to leave, right? The idea is that they come here, they go through the program, and our expectation and our, our, our encouragement is for them to actually become part of the vibrant ecosystem that is Leighton. So they're learning about some of the same things that you'd have in Lean Startup and uh, i the innovation course sponsored by the NSF, yes. or with our military and government uh, context, the Hacking for Defense program, which is very much about uh, identifying a problem and looking at those solutions ties in very closely with the Tech Bridge Innovation Network too. But one of the things that I know you and I have talked about a lot is just this idea of connecting the communities of the advanced modeling and simulation and what they're doing with high-speed networks, what Verizon is bringing to the table within this very health-oriented community too. So are there any things that you've seen that we, we should pick up on in terms of um, our military and uh, government I partners? think the, the idea of innovative collaboration, which is kind of like the moniker we use to describe this and this environment that we are trying to create, mm -hmm. is something that is that is very applicable mm -hmm. uh, to our to the, not only for our civilian environment but also for our defense and for our military environment. Um, we provide an environment where people from diverse places actually communicate, and we have found that the people that are in let's say the HR position in the USDA, which is uh -huh. located here in the Gnona, right. the US Tennis, Association, yep. and the people that work in one of our labs here, they actually have the same challenges. Like for example, training for millennials, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that both the military and the civilian <laughs> world have in common, is how Correct. do we provide effective engaging training for these new, uh, you know, for these new younger generations that learn differently, that have an ability to absorb information at a different, at a different pace. So we have found, you know, not only great collaboration opportunities with UCF, with, you know, not only with our medical school here in the campus, but you know, with a lot of the labs where we have great relationships. But we we know that from a from a defense and from a military perspective, there's a variety of applications, you know, in this collaborative innovation environment. Yeah, well, we've been so happy for UCF to be innovators, and maybe to also help serve as that academic bridge to other academic areas to also serve as a bridge between our government and military partners in this Team Orlando uh, innovation hotspot that's been continuing on for a long period of time. And to see how that expands into this part of the community too, and out to our national community that we have too, when we start thinking about all of the applications across the whole, the whole globe really, but across the US in particular for a lot of the things we do with the NTSA audience. So I just want to say thank you so much for, for hosting us today, for um, allowing us to come in and see no, this space. Maybe we can uh, pan around and just kind of see the environment as we uh, trail off to go into uh, a, a separate room so that we can uh, take questions and answers. So get your Q&A ready if you have some questions for me or anyone else on the team. And uh, we'll start making our way over to the, the Q&A area.
So it's been great to see the teams work and get to work with them in a uh, mentor-protege relationship and look at how some of the innovation ecosystem throughout not just um, Team Orlando and UCF, but out here into the Lake Nona community can all come together in a unique way and work together. So I'll get myself situated in here and then be ready for some of the, the potential Q&A that we might have for either me or for some of the others that are in the uh, environment, out there in the environment uh, too, online. So thank you guys. Appreciate everyone's help for pulling this off today too. We've had a great cast. Um, I will be able to um, remove my mask at this point too. The name of the building is Pixon. I'm gonna stay in chat for just a minute. The name of the building is the Pixon Building. It's P-I-X-O-N, and it's right across from the Lake Nona Town Center off Lake Nona Boulevard. And um, it's a relatively new building, but what most people might know about it, uh, not to advertise, but is, is Foxtails is uh, in that uh, same building uh, on the first floor, and it's right next to there too. So if uh, we can get Juan's contact information for you as well, so that you can uh, see if it's something that you guys would like to take a little bit closer look at, uh, either uh, for those of you here in Orlando or either for those of you that might be coming into the Orlando area too, to be able to do that. So we'd be happy to do that too. Great question, appreciate that. Other questions that we might have too. I see one here. Have you guys considered using this technology for WMD devices, weapons of mass destruction devices, such as mustard gas canisters, most commonly found in Iraq and IED devices, or other training for high risk training besides medical purposes? The answer to that is yes. Some of those applications with a kind of quick turnaround, we weren't able to get through uh, the whole PAO process to maybe show that to you today, but those are applications of 5G and use cases that are already being used and developed. And then you also have things like the tracking using blockchain to track munitions, to track their locations, to track supply chain, and have a verifiable record that uh, has another layer of encryption and trust that you might have. Those are some of the things that we're starting to see early examples of, along with, of course, the augmented and virtual reality, where you can look through a uh, head-mounted display at a field and you'll have virtual pinpoints, a digital overlay or a digital twin of that field, and be able to see where there might be mines or other IEDs, uh, improvised explosive devices that might be out there. So that's a great example of a use case. I'd love to hear some other examples of use cases that you guys might be interested in um, talking about, hearing about, or that you've been working on in your organizations too, through either the Q&A or the chat. Feel free to, to chime in. As we're doing that, I just wanted to point out a lot of the synergy with some of the groups that you heard from today too. If you think about the whole ecosystem of the Internet of Things and the various components and parts of core infrastructure like what Dell provides, some of the overlay of um, advanced cyber and software that CACI provides, the applications and the space of the, the actual application space and uh, the operations of say the VA or the Navy, all coming together in unique ways. And of course, riding on top of carrier technology like we have from Verizon. Those are some of the things that, uh, that you've seen. If there's any other audio questions too that we have, happy to take those as well. And uh, I just wanna say too, that I appreciate everyone who uh, has shown up today and uh, has uh, an interest in and a passion for that next generation innovation. Hey, David, so if you check our pub under the Q&A, go to published, you'll see all the questions there. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. <laughs> oh yes, quite a few. Um, can you highlight what five, how 5G is enabling those? Yeah, too. So hopefully you, you saw a few examples of the ability to have high speed data is going to be needed. The more encryption that you have, too, on things like blockchain that I was mentioning before, the use of 3D data sets, they're exponentially larger when you have things like COVID imaging that is in 3D versus 2D, or you have these very large uh, six gig data sets. To be able to do things at speed or near speed out in the field is gonna be something that's very important. So I, that's a great question. And those are a few examples of where those have come into play. 
So they were asking about a couple of the products being um, web-based and uh, needing connections and whether or not they've gone through uh, CMMC and have an ATO in place. So a lot of these things are going through the cyber capability maturity model right now. Uh, as you know, the uh, audit standards are still in works, but uh, I know at least at UCF, and I, I think I could speak for the, the groups that I know that were on here too with the VA and with uh, Navy and also with uh, CACI that we are all uh, marching to the beat of uh, C CMMC for how we handle uh, the, the, for official use only and uh, controlled unclassified information. So that's a great question. Those are some of the things that are going to have additional overhead on top of the actual data to, again, keep them safe. That extra overhead, uh, 5G is going to help us to make sure that we have things at speed or near real-time speed. If we're talking about field-based holograms, those are things that are only going to be enabled by 5G. Some of the smart sensors, the ability to have that brain gateway sensor and the brain gateway sensor connect to the head-mounted display. Those are examples of other areas where you're going to have to have that high-speed 5G network to be able to do that. So the question uh, that we have too is why wouldn't hospitals use traditional internet uh, that's, that's wired over 5G? Well, you will when you're inside of those uh, fixed locations, but as we know, uh, medicine and healthcare and wellness happens everywhere. So having the ability to have those technologies and have better tracking of a suite of sensors that might be on a, a soldier, a sailor, or Marine in the future, those are the types of things that we're going to be looking at. And of course, the when you look at the technologies and how they're used in aviation for airmen and others too, those are some of the ways that you need to have those technologies remote, but also secure as you go through this process. So what are some of the technologies being used in, in Army? The examples that we shared with uh, and that, that CACI shared with IVAS is an Army Future Command um, uh, product and platform. So that's some of what's happening in the uh, on the LVC uh, spectrum, the live virtual and um, and constructive within the STE environment to the synthetic training environment. Those are some of the areas that uh, you will you will see. So that's a great question too. appreciate that. What are some of the considerations for Web3? on 5G enabled equipment. Will remotely deployed units be able to establish temporary secure networks regardless of local infrastructure? And could they expect to have reach back support via that same network? I'm happy to have any of uh, the others from CACI or from uh, Verizon chime in on this too. But the short answer is yes. Some of these Web3 technologies where you have another layer like a MetaMask or something else too that may get an ATO in the future and may pass some of the STIGs are going to be able to be allowed to have those again secure networks too and uh, that's where you'll be able to use things like ultra wideband and leverage those even if you also have, have to have other layers of protection on there not just VPN but maybe even more than a VPN. So it depends on the level of, of information of course as we all know but those are some of the things that you might uh, consider that you might see as uh, we go forward. Great question. So there's a few uh, other discussions about tactical medicine and uh, the certification of WMD. And I think we answered some of those too. And then also considering manufacturing. Um, can a small business use the lab to test existing COTS equipment in a 5G environment? Uh, for example, to prove existing LVC capability, live virtual and constructive capability that has been field tested over 5G. There's probably two answers to that. There is a during COVID answer and there is a post COVID answer too. But Juan, do you have any uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we would love to hear of all solutions. And that, I, that's, I know that's something that Verizon is also interested in doing. We mm -hmm. do have millimeter 5G service inside the lab, mm -hmm. and we also have millimeter 5G service right outside the lab as well. So millimeter 5G service inside the lab and right outside the lab, and it's going to be expanding at least by a few blocks in this area. So for kind of field application testing as well as indoor application yeah. testing, both of those two. And that's something that they could contact you. Is it okay yeah, to give out your... Yeah, uh, Juan, J-U-A-N yeah, yeah, yeah. dot Santos, S-A-N-T-O-S, at Tavistock, T-A-V-I-S-T-O-C-K 
dot com. Yep. That's okay. Me. So got it. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can uh, put that back into the chat. So someone can type that back into the chat for us too. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's a, a way to get in touch, to find out more and see if the application you're talking about truly would be a good test for uh, Verizon and uh, the Tavistock team here in Lake Nona to uh, provide testing. And, and that's probably not uh, just for the local area too. This is a nationwide program. Verizon's a nationwide international even company. So those are some things to consider too, if you're not in the local area and as you might watch this in a recording after the fact too. What's the reliability in the field? What problems have you encountered on home base and what is the time frame to recover the, the issues? So I think it's the same type of protocol and uh, orders and fragos that you might have to go walk through a checklist for any other technology, whether that's jitters or any other type of radio frequency. So I think that that's the same type of protocols that you're gonna use for establishment of connection, for troubleshooting on any of these two. I cannot speak personally to what the, the exact timeframes are on those or what that might look like, but those are some things that uh, might help with that question. Um, if anybody else has any, any information on that too from, uh, from the other companies, happy to have you chime in. The next question is, are the infrastructure requirements and coverage limitations of 5G able to provide the military with training anytime and anywhere? There is um, some things that we're looking at with 5G, of course, with the closer density of the networks, of the mesh of networks too. Having um, every few uh, telephone poles, let's say, or every few light posts, having a uh, repeater and a, and a micro cell for signal. Those are some of the things that are unique to 5G. That gives you a number of benefits too, in terms of location. Um, repeater cells and the way that you might also leverage 5G connected to another type of uh, technology, whether that's a different broadband technology, satellite, or other types of secure communications are things that are open to the imagination and open to uh, possibilities of new architecture. So there's no one right answer on that question from an architectural standpoint, but there's a lot of options and opportunity too. So I'd encourage you to talk to some of our friends at Verizon too, who have whole divisions that are uh, very helpful to our government solutions and uh, military. Those are some of the groups that you may want to check in with Charlie on too. And you see his contact information there too. Great series of questions. I know this is taking us pretty close to our time. I'll pause and see if there's any other questions or any other questions from Linda or our organizers and anything else that we should, should cover too. But I appreciate all of you attending today and I appreciate the partnerships that we have uh, through UCF with all of these other groups from military, from government, from industry, uh, other parts of academia that are all working together to secure our future and look at the internet of things, how 5G and other infrastructure is enabling that, and the way that we are looking for, constantly looking for new applications and use cases that could benefit from this technology. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Linda, for any closing remarks and any final questions. Okay, thank you, David, and to all the members of this outstanding demonstration panel. It was, it was terrific. Thank you so much. I, and before we go, I'd like to recognize a few of the NTSA events team supporting today's webinar. Uh, Mr. Daniel Shafadi from the Ackerman Corporation is the chair of the webinar committee. Mr. Bob Kleinhampel from SCIC, Ms. Juliana Sly, CEO of Government Business Results, Ms. Debbie Langelier and Ms. Renee Despot from NTSA, and of course, um, our own Admiral Rob, President of NTSA. Um, our April webinar will be on April 28th, which is the last Wednesday of the month again at 11 o'clock Eastern, and we'll be focusing on healthcare and patient safety. We continue to look forward to an in-person ISIC where we can all be together in November. And I thank you very much uh, on behalf of NTSA for joining us today. And thank you again, David and the team. We'll see you all in April. Bye-bye. Thank you all.